Okay, we're live, we're live. We're wrapped in our woolies. Sarah's wrapped in her woolly hat because a boiler isn't working. I'm wrapped in my woolly scarf because I like fluffy. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our live stream this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Heidi Maver. I'm apparently a best selling author and founder of EOTAS Matters. Um, we work supporting families of children and young people who can't be in school, and we do that predominantly through educating and supporting parents to understand the EHCP system in the UK. Um, I'm joined today by Maddie and Sarah. I'll let them do their own introductions. Susan. 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 Sorry. I have a phone call on the block about, do you know what it is? It's because, anyway, it doesn't matter. I won't even tell no, you. No, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm joined today by Maddie and Susan. <laughs> I'll let them do their own introductions. Right, Maddie, go on. You go first. Um, I don't really know. That's one of them spare of the moment things. Tell me something. Um, I'm Maddie Roberts, half of a petition running with Susan to look at attendance fines and the attendance guidance. Um, I've got three children, one of which is absolutely thriving with the Otis after a long, long battle. Um, yeah, and I just like being a voice now. Rent a gobshite, you are, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and Susan. <laughs> so I, I think people call me Sarah. That is definitely a thing. Maybe I should be a Sarah. But anyway, I'm like Susan. Sarah. Anyway, go on. I think I must do. No, I do actually think I must do because that does really happen a lot. Um, yeah, I'm the other half of the gobshites, and I also talk about attendance and petitions quite a lot. Uh, I'm also a moderator, along with Maddie as well, in Not Finding School, um, so I kind of help out in that arena. It's going absolutely bonkers at the moment and has done for the past few months with new arrivals, unfortunately, as a result of attendance guidance. Um, yeah, so I can mainly be found just talking a lot about how rubbish attendance guidance is. Uh, I also have, I have two children and uh, one with an EOTAS package as well. So, so yeah. we all and three we have all... children who have experienced barriers to attendance and we've all three been through the EHCP system and we're all three bang that drum fairly regularly uh, talking about how ridiculous attendance data collection and requirements and enforcement is so the morning we this morning we wanted to talk a little about good morning tony i'm not a lady but good morning um <laughs> this morning we wanted to talk a little bit about the call for evidence that's come out um from the government so there is a call for evidence currently so basically what that means is there's a select committee that are going to be meeting and they've asked people from the sector to make submissions and basically say we think when you're having this conversation, these people, these opinions, these views, this content should be put in front of the panel discussing this. Um, so it is intended to be a call to evidence to the sector. So they're actually asking people from education, from, you know, from that, all of that. Um, and it's not specifically a request for parents. But we do know that when we had the SEN review um, and we flooded the DfE with parent testimonies, that it definitely had an impact. Like we know that when the Send Green Paper was out, um, that the feedback from ministers was, we've never seen a response like this. And we want to do that again. Because what we feel really passionately about, my cat really wants to go out. What we feel really passionately about is that these conversations should not be happening about our children and our families and our lived experiences without someone who is there to represent us and to speak on our behalf who also has that lived experience. So what we're going to do this morning is just going to have a chat about where we're at currently with attendance and like what we think the direction is going in, what our issues are with it specifically, and then talk you a little bit through how to make a response to that call for evidence and give you a bit of a guidance to kind of like to submit Basically, case studies is what we're thinking might be a good a good approach. Do you want to talk a little bit, um, one of you, either of you, I'm not going to throw you under the bus, about what your experience has been in terms of why this is coming up so much and what the concerns are for you as a collective and for us more generally through Not Finding School and working with Square Peg and EOTAS Matters. Does one of you want to take the lead on that? Yeah, I'm happy to go first, Maddie, and then you can fill in any gaps. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, I, in simple terms, there's like 
the new attendance guidance came out and it was effective in September 2022. Um, however, before that, um, both Maddie and I, kind of around the same time, we both had similar problems with our ch children facing barriers to attendance. And we both had our brush ups against um, kind of local authority, uh, welfare officers or attendance officers kind of threatening us with fines and things like that. Um, but at that time, the government stance, what they weren't taking such a hard stance on kind of attendance. I was fairly lucky. I mean, I, well, I was lucky and I was unlucky in that actually my child's attendance was being authorised, but my local authority still asked for medical evidence. Now, if I'd known what I know now, I would know that that wasn't needed, but I didn't know anything at that time. I was just very fortunate that I had a GP that just wrote a letter um, which was very fortunate. But I immediately realised the privilege of that situation because I knew that it wasn't a doctor's role to do that. And they can quite rightly, and they do often, refuse to do that. And so it became clear to me, even at that point, that this is kind of, this is completely wrong. Like we're asking for help and actually we're being asked to prove our child's um, illness. So that was immediately like kind of bubbling around. And then when I started reading... So it was Nadim Sahari at the time. And he was sending out these like documents or letters to head teachers saying, right, we've got to toughen up on attendance. It's got to be 100 percent. I was like, oh, well, hang on a minute. And then I read the new attendance guidance before it was obviously um, effective. Withdrawn. And yeah. yeah, and just thought this is going to be absolutely awful because it it talks about support, which you might think, oh, that's great. It mentions support, but it doesn't define it at all. And actually, because it doesn't define it and it doesn't tell local authorities and schools what to do, while it does really clearly define what sanctions to take, it's, I mean, we all know what local authorities and schools can be like in the absence of clearly defined processes, like the worst going to happen. So, and Maddie was there feeling the same and we were both in your IOTAS group. Um, and I think I'd written like an open letter, exactly, some scope. I mean, this is a new thing that's coming up in Not Finding the School, Shelley Ann. We're actually seeing this that people are providing GP letters. So I went around it because because schools and local authorities were saying we need evidence. So then we all got together and there were various templates kicking about of take this to your GP, ask your GP to send this letter, which isn't them signing them off school, but just saying this child is experiencing X, Y, or Z, and as such, adjustments should be made according to their attendance because they're not well. And then the pushback from that was, well, we're not going to accept these letters now. So we did what was required. But actually, and the goals are at a cost. Just, yeah, the bars, are paying yeah. for them. The bars move. <laughs> so that was kind of happening. And then Maddie and I just came together in a sort of EOTAS meeting. I was like, I've just written this open letter. Yeah. Maddie's like, right, we're doing something for this. And then basically by the end of that day, we decided it was going to be a petition. I won't go too much into the details of that because we talked about that before, but we basically decided on a change petition very specifically, uh, just because it could be a long running campaign rather than a government debate. So lots and lots of reasons for that. And actually we've been quite fortunate um, because the petition has been identified as one that has the potential to win. We have a manager and we have some help um, and guidance really. Um, yeah, and this is another thing that we see, Danica, is people re deregistering. They may not want to deregister, but they're just forced into it as well. So, and this is what I think Maddie and I both could see that in the new attendance guidance. And that's kind of, that's what formed the petition. Um, so that was kind of before it really kicked off, it was kind of bubbling. And then really what we've seen since September, since the new guidance has been in place, is we have really seen that explosion. And we're seeing that in the numbers of people joining Not Fine in School, the numbers of people that are getting penalty fines and notices. Um, and the government are just holding the line at the moment. They're very much holding the line. So um, we're kind of utilising like democratic processes and like um, writing to a, I'm writing to my MP. I've had a meeting with my MP just had a message back I've just had a letter back from Nick Gibb um, and it's it's getting less generic in the reply but it's still reminding Mrs Liverman that children have a legal blah 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 to be in school and to attend and it's still pretty generic and it's not facing into any of the actual issues that I kind of raised which is that this is what's happening to parents um, so yeah there's that kind of those sort of official government lines aren't really that they're not listening to us at the moment and that's why these things like these call to evidence 
um, that's why they become really important, I think, um, yeah. to, to push back against that line, which currently the Department for Education and the government is holding firm on at the moment. That's my impression as a bystander. I'm not a political person, but they are very like, they're not budging on that mm -hmm. stance, at least mm -hmm. in front of house anyway. Um, so, yeah. And I think the thing that what we want to get across, and we'll talk about how we how we recommend that um, parents, if they want to respond to this call for evidence, how they go about that. We'll talk about the nitty gritty of that in a minute. But I think what is really important is that the narrative still seems to be that there are parents who are intentionally flouting the law. I don't know, because we don't want to get out of our pajamas or something, um, or because we're all like living in crack dens um, and we're not taking our kids to school um, and we're doing that on purpose because we're neglectful um, and we're difficult and we're um, and, and missing that thing of you know the call for evidence is around uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable children um, but they're missing the fact that actually children with special educational needs are by definition disadvantaged and vulnerable um, and they're missing that entirely. And when people hear disadvantaged and vulnerable, they think of, you know, like high rise council flats. And and don't get me wrong, we have many members in our community who live in high rise council flats. It's not a moral yeah. judgment at all. But it's this kind of like, you know, that kind of like stereotype, neglect. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, thing. and that assumption. Um, and, and I think that's the thing that we want to get across. And the other thing we want to get across is that attendance sanctions and the focus on attendance for attendance sake does not work. Like it doesn't work. So we want to kind of like have people share their experiences of, you know, if you've been asked to go and touch the freaking gate, <laughs> you know, what effect has that had on your child? What effect has it had on your child of them being forced into school but then to be sat in a corridor in a learn or in a learning support unit and not in a class you know they're not actually learning and it is it further traumatizing them and longer term what has been the impact of that has that meant that actually they've spent more time out of school than they should have done because the support wasn't there and actually when they're talking about support what they're really talking about is pressure to get them in they're not talking about you know once they're through the doors it's like oh they're in excellent we've done our job yeah you know. it's like understanding the need isn't it and like this is i mean there's so many people now kind of advocating for that um and so many you know different sources and you know you've got like Naomi fisher dr Naomi fisher she's really talking about understanding behaviors communication there's really good evidence for this but yeah it's not it's not titrating into the into the school system at the moment yeah coercive yeah. control it's the fear the fear factor um and if you're a family it. who who are not in a position to pay school fines and you you know when you're in like that response as a parent and you're like you're experiencing trauma as well and you're frightened and like for me you know I'm a single parent and when we were going through this I couldn't have paid a fine and if I'd been imprisoned no one would look at, be able to be able to look after my child so for me in that situation, if that had happened, I probably would have had to deregister just to escape the risk of being fined and imprisoned. And then that means my child is not accessing any education, you know, and that's not to say that electively home ed is not an option and not a really good option for many people because it absolutely But it is. should be a choice. That's a what choice. I think. I, and I felt like that at the time, you know, when home education was being suggested to us, I was like, I it should be a choice. And I actually love some principles of unschooling and things like that. But there was no way that I felt that that should be, that should be sort of forced upon us. Um, and I think there is an element of coercive control. I, the stories that I hear, I mean, some it, the, the things that happen to people. So someone um, got in contact with me, they're pregnant, um, looking after um, a child with additional, they've been asking um their local authority for help and for alternative provision they got a call on a friday afternoon um from the local authority and she's like, oh good i've been trying to get hold of you oh no i'm just fain to let you know that we're deciding whether to prosecute you bye left her for two weeks and it's like these are people you know pregnant stress and like what, where's the humanity and the compassion in that approach for, you know, talking to another human being in that way, I think. Um, so, yeah. And where, and the narrative that goes with that, that we're going to fine you or prosecute you because you can't get your child into school. You're a criminal. 
you know, like, and for people who, for, for, for neurodivergent people, many of the parents of neurodivergent kids are neurodivergent themselves. The threat of a criminal prosecution <laughs> is terrifying and yeah. really upsetting. And, you know, many of us are very much like, well, I wouldn't even, you know, eat a great panazza. Like, Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, no, no, I'm the same. I mean, I've, you know, I'm someone that's previously been described as, oh, you're like too nice and things like that. But I think when I went through this process, it brought out, I think it was the unfairness and the, and, and there's probably a certain amount mm. of privilege in that as well. So having, you know, which I think, so I acknowledge that, but then I also think, well, that can still radiate out because actually I just felt this sense of rage where actually like, I've been, I've adhered to rules of the system and did it, and then, yes, yeah, so it kind of triggered, like it almost triggered like the opposite where I was like, right, I'm chaining myself to those local authority railings. That's like, that. that's not fair. Um, but actually that's not, you know, if you're in... I was privileged to be able to have that reaction in the first place, if that makes sense. So, any, yeah. Yeah. Um, what did you want yeah. to add, Maddie? Did you want to add something? She just sat nodding. Yeah, yeah it makes sense for me to be not the talking one. <laughs> um, yeah, it just, it really is. And uh, like somebody's just said here, you know, it's not electively home educating, it's unelectively home educating. And that could be a really interesting um point of the outcome if people do do this um survey is to be able to say well actually the whole system failed us and the outcome of that was i've had to unelectively home educate or um like with the the like you just said heidi it was the threat of the fine that left me with no other choice you know because like susan said that is the thing isn't it it's that unfairness it's like how is this fair when We've talked about it with, within the guidance of what we would like to see in the definition of support in the petition, you know, because there isn't that um, there isn't that clear idea of what that support looks like. And it can be just a case of, you know, we've tried the things that you've suggested and that hasn't worked. And then it's almost like, well, they just then give up and go, oh, well, you've you've not succeeded. So we're going to find you. And it's like, well. I'm engaging with you. I'm trying. I'm I'm wanting my child to be having an education. How's that fair if your idea of what support is doesn't work? But what our idea of support is when we ask for EOTUS or, you know, other provisions and you disagree with us, we don't have a choice. We have, you know, you can't. Uh, yeah, it makes me. I think really the other. Sad. And also, you know, the other thing to point out, which I've only really kind of really realised in the past sort of couple of months, is that there's no right of appeal on a penalty fine notice. There's no right of appeal. And so you literally have more rights with a parking fine. So even if you're going through all these kind of, you know, EHCP, you're talking to people, there's no right of appeal unless you don't pay it and then you have a day in court, which is very risky. And, you know, I think... I certainly would have, been, would have been absolutely terrified by that prospect. Um, and when so... you're going through everything else that you're going through and you're trying to take care of a, a poorly child, the last thing you need is a day in court. Like, mm -hmm. And that is the fear, isn't it? Like what you're saying, because we're doing everything we can to try and get support and protect our vulnerable children. That, that would be like some put said here it isn't for some people it isn't about the money then you know if people can afford to pay the fine but then it's that idea of well what if you do take me to prison what is going to happen to my child who is going to look after them when we know that we're the ones that are fighting so hard and it's you know other children in your family the I've got other children here and then you've got a husband that obviously is at work all the time to be able to provide the finances, you know, take me out of that and imprison me. I don't yeah. see how they think this is going to help the situation. And this comment here from Amanda, when the Senko asked if we've tried telling the child that you could get fined or sent to prison mm -hmm. if they don't go to school, like, fuck off. It's, not do that yeah. kids. Like, I think we've um, got children who are already traumatized by the school system and you want us to tell them if you don't go to school i'm going to end up in prison like that's not going to help them no it you doesn't know, i mean i've we actually work even if that does work 
the impact on their mental health and your relationship as a family is going to be catastrophic you know i've actually a, a young person um kind of wrote wrote to us um to kind of share her experience she's now um 18 um but she kind of experienced this um persistent absence she was i think it was due to bullying um and she actually talked directly about the impact of so her parents didn't kind of use that on her but she was obviously aware that they were being threatened with fines and she actually specifically wrote to us about the impact of that and how it sort of sent her spiraling worse into her depression because obviously it, you know it just spirals down doesn't it it's not going to kind of um help in any way so i think you know that that is actually being used by senkos um as a kind of lever it yeah it just kind of it's it that just power trip how... again isn't it it's like that power that they think that oh you know if we tell you that or you tell your child that i'm going to get in trouble it's that trying to get the power over him and i've written yeah. before like about i remember we had a worker in and she did yeah harley come down and was really upset and he was saying oh you know i don't think it's fair that the government get these robbers that take money and he was quite riled up about it and that was obviously his understanding of it and she just leant across the table like actually leant across the table and was like that's how we make parents make their children go to school and i was just like get out of my house just <laughs> actually get out of my house you're classing this as support and you're coming in and telling my then eight-year-old child that's that that's how they're going to make us do it. We have, and that is again that is support. That is you yeah. know that was a service that was meant to be providing us support, support to do what we are telling you you've got to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not support, is it? <laughs> no. We had it this week. So my son, we're really fortunate. We're in the OTAS success story. He's back in mainstream with a package of support. He's doing really well. He's enjoying it. He's engaging well. His attendance is fairly good, although it's certainly not 100% and it, and it won't be. Um, they had a, a, a chat this week from a senior leader in the college about attendance. Um, and I actually emailed someone and said I need to get in touch with this person and have a conversation with them and I got without even um like a, let's have a conversation about it I got an email back off them telling me what had been said and why it had been said and that my son had obviously misunderstood before I'd even told her what my issues with oh, what she'd said you. were one of my biggest issues was that she stood in front of a room full of young adults so my son's 18 most of the kids in his class are 17 um and said I want you to imagine that someone you really care about who works really hard and is a taxpayer, I want you to imagine that you've got to tell them that you're wasting £5,000 of their money because you're not turning up at college. Just... And my son was heartbroken. He's like, is that what people think of that I was doing when I was not able to go to school? You know, and that I sat on governing bodies in schools and they're saying you know the important thing is is that attendance matters you know and, and and it's this obsession with the idea that if they're not in school they're either not safe or they're not learning and we know that there's so much more to it than that we know that there are kids in school sat in corridors we know that there are kids in school sat in classrooms on their own not learning not getting access to good quality teaching we know that there are kids who literally are dragged across a car park touch a frigging gate get a tick on the register and then go home they're not mm. you know it's the quality is not there and it's all about the numbers and the data and this obsession with numbers and ticks you know that kid's in that kid's in that kid's in and you know when I first spoke about the gate touching I thought it was a singular experience I thought that our Senko was having some kind of psychotic episode thinking that it would be a good method I've since learned that there are thousands of families mm. whose children it's suggested that they go and touch a gate because that would be an attendance mark just get them to touch the gate you know and it's mm. just like you touch the freaking gate i think when we go to when we go to london for the petition delivery we need to go and stand outside the dfe or something and all be holding the gate and have placards yeah. that, you touch the freaking gate <laughs> But the really interesting thing, what you're saying there, Heidi, is literally like they're the kind of things that do the government know, do they not? These are the actual things that we need to evidence to them that is actually happening. Um, yeah. And in, in being able to share our frustration at, 
you know, the suggestions that are given to us or the ideas that are given to us to support um, our children to get into school and that attendance is so important to schools that this is what they're actually asking parents to do because uh, there is a whole world out there and I'm sure many people in the government don't live in this world, wouldn't even think that this is the kind of stuff that is suggested or done. Um, and this is our opportunity and this is, you know, what Susan and I have said about the petition the whole time. We want to be a platform for parent voices. We want to be a platform for these stories so that they can be seen and heard by people that just wouldn't even believe these things go on. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that's it, that, that I think sometimes people are like, when I tell these stories, people are like, really? And I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. look at how many people have, like, I know I keep banging on about the book, but the response to the book has been, this is our story. We were told mm -hmm. to touch the gate. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, I'm not, we're not making it up. Like, <laughs> this is like... Oh considered a genuine intervention, a helpful intervention. And I think the biggest thing for me is, like Paula said, one of the things is that one of the many reasons that our children are not in school is because the support is not in school. And that's because it takes so long to get an EHCP. We have to fight so hard for reasonable adjustments. We have to fight doubly hard for specialist provision. And all the while, our kids are being asked to go into an environment that is not suitable for them and not meeting their needs. And that's why attendance slips. If kids were happy, healthy and supported in the setting that they were needed to be in, they would skip into school. They would. Like, we know that because we know that when we get it right for them, that's what happens. You know, yeah. not all children. Mm -hmm. Some children need a different way of learning. But, you know, Theo's a really good example of when you get it right, he'll fly. You know, when you get it wrong, he can't get out of bed. So, you know, it's it, it, and, and the bigger picture stuff is like you've then got these children and young adults growing up into adulthood who not only potentially have missed out on an education, but they've missed out on being able to trust people they've missed out on building meaningful relationships they've missed out on chance to grow their emotional literacy or grow their emotional independence and their emotional um kind of maturity they've they miss out on so much and then they then head into the adult system and they don't have what we want them to have got from education because we've basically told them it's this way or no way like you can, if you can sit in this box, you can get an education. If you can't sit in this box, um, then we're going to fine you for not being able to sit in this box and you're not going to get what you're entitled to. And that's disgusting. Yeah, yeah so. definitely. And costly in the long, if you want to, if they want to look at it from a commercial basis, it's costlier in the long term because, you know, that, that trauma, it just gets bigger, that trauma, doesn't it? The bit, you yeah. know, the older you are. And the how you know the harder that plays out. So exactly, exactly. So let's talk about what we're going to recommend that people do for the call to evidence. So we're suggesting that people would write themselves a bit of a mini case study. Yes, um, and now I know that they've said you know like the there's something like a word count on it. We're, like I think it's up to is it up to three thousand words or something, Maddie? That they yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, mm -hmm. yeah you don't have to write 3000 words, right? Like we're not, <laughs> you don't have to write 3000 words at all. You can, and, and what we're going to do, I think is we're going to make a template, but do you want to just talk through the two of you or whichever of you or whoever, what we think should be your angle with that, what you submit for your case study? Because it's really important that we keep it in a particular style and tone. Listen to us tone policing neurodivergent people, but stick with us. Like this is about us playing the game. So do you want to talk about that a bit? I think one of the things I always I always send my stuff to Susan before we ever like put things out because I'm quite an emotional person and I get very sort of drawn into telling the whole story and the feelings and the all of that. Um, but I actually we discuss this and I actually think what would be really helpful for this is more like factual. We've got to like take away I guess the emotion and the frustration which we rightly have about the system um, and like Susan was saying to me, you know, not about opinion, not about saying that your system's broken and this doesn't work or whatever. It's yeah. the actual facts of what's happened for your family. Um, potentially sort of, you know, that you've applied for an EHCP that got declined. Um, you've then been on a waiting list to see CAMS for two years. You got into CAMS and they decided that, no, actually, we're not going to take you on. You've then been uh, with a threat of fines. 
And then the outcome of that, like we've already talked about, you know, it was enough for a threat of a fine that I then removed my child from the system. I'm now classed as electively home educating. This isn't electively home educating. And just, you know, some people do have the spoons to go in and write a bigger story. But if you don't have that, then that's not a problem at all. You know, just even the bullet points, a very quick bullet point or how many years you've been known in the system. I mean, my personally, when we managed to get to the point of the OTAS, my paperwork was five years. Um, I'd been at the start that I'd gone in and said, my son's four and he's struggling. And it was five years before we got, I mean, we're now into year six, but a year after he OTAS and he is now completely thriving and like a different child. But them five years were you know, heartbreaking and horrendous and frustrating. But that is probably not what the government want to hear. You know, we want to express that, but just, you know, the facts, the simple facts, maybe, if that's easier. Yeah, I think what we, like, do what feels right for you. We're not telling you you can't express, like, your feelings. <laughs> you know, you, you're human. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're not part of you. And... <laughs> um. We will find other places for us to do that shouting and screaming and telling people that they've let our kids yeah. down. We will find those places to say that. This is probably the, not the right vehicle for that. What this is, is it's, a, it's a request for suggestions for what evidence should be put in front of that select committee. So what I would suggest is that you, you write your case story, a bit about your history, what your experience has been, what attendance interventions were imposed on you or your family what worked what definitely didn't work and um, what the outcome was longer term and whether you found a way through that maybe even if there have been things that schools and colleges have done that have been really successful talk about that you know because what we want to do is we want to say look schools are saying they're going to find us because they don't know what else to do we want to show them there are other ways to approach this you know we want to show them that being flexible and you know not marking a child as an authorized absence just because i say just because but because they're struggling with the transition of getting into the school building and giving them an extra hour to do that is a really good way to support them and it will potentially for lots of children mean they can be in the setting you want them to be in you know, and I think one of the things that's really important with this is that it's a call to evidence and we're saying, here's what we've got to say. And we would like parent voice to be represented in that evidence um, yes, presentation. Yeah. So including your case study, we feel it's really important that there is someone there to talk with lived experience as a parent who has experienced these things. And we would request that the evidence when it's put to panel includes that. You can maybe even say, you know, perhaps you would approach someone like Not Fine in School or Square Peg, you know, get those names on there so we can show them that, like, we're all having conversations. We're not like random nutcase parents writing from a darkened room at the top of a set of stairs. Like, we're not, we're doing this and we're, and, and we're being strategic and we will play the game, but you've got to give us a seat at that table. That's what we're, that's, that's what we're aiming for. So yeah. as much as is humanly possible, try to come off as reasonable. <laughs> Yeah, I think my point. Yeah, I say, sorry, so I forget about... that there's positive ones out there. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah, I think like my point about feelings was not so much. I will definitely share my feelings about our situation, like as in yeah. how I felt when you treated me like this. It felt like this. It wasn't so much like don't share your feelings. It was more like I could definitely write a full spiel of this is broken. You're all wrong, and you're not listening. But actually, what actually they need to hear is what happened to us as a family and I would yeah. definitely include my feelings about that because that was a massive part of like oh. the impact of it because how you feel is then determines like kind of how you act and stuff you know your ability to work and function in other areas so yeah so sorry if I was trying to if I no no I, I was it, saying, like do not a, feel yeah yeah no, we're not yeah, no not I was feel. saying that's not what yeah. I was saying when I was saying like fact it's just I know from my personal perspective I tend to go off on a tangent in that way and it will become more of a, a piece of writing that's about me and my family and all of that rather do you know what I mean so yeah, yeah. I wasn't either saying like don't say that you know it's not affected yeah. you but for some people that might be too much that's all I'm you know yeah. it might yeah, be too that's much true to as well. write all yeah. that and if that's the case then please still submit something that just is 
you know, even a few bullet points because it's it, that is evidence enough if you if you can't even if feelings. you wrote and said my child's been out of school with unmet special educational needs since this date. We've been threatened with fines. The impact on our family has been significant. We're all suffering. It hasn't helped to be threatened with a fine. Um, he's still not accessing an education. We would like stories like ours to be included in the evidence, please. That yes. would be sufficient. You know, yes. like if you don't have the spoons for any more than that. And if you don't have spoons, don't force yourself. Like this is for people who have capacity. And we all know that depending on where you are in this pathway um will depend on whether how much you can or can't do please do not feel like you have to do this do this if it if you have capacity and do this if it feels like something you can do without putting yourself under unnecessary trauma or burden because that's you know we've got to take care of it, each other here as well so i'm going to put some comments up um just so we can I want just to also add to that Heidi obviously um Susan and I are do, are going to do a bigger piece on sort of the 3,000 words from the petition point of view that we're going to then submit with our own stories plus stories that we've heard through the petition so if there is anybody that really feels like oh I'd love to have a voice but I just can't if they I know you're going to pop up the page in the email if they want to get in touch with us then you know we can help with that yeah yeah for yeah. sure United Front and all that. Okay, so let's just look at some comments because I don't want people to have put the labour in and not have this shared. So our family liaison said to me, he just needs to realise he can't leave whenever he wants. I knew instantly it was over for us with that school as actually what my seriously anxious child needed was to know that he could leave whenever he wanted and yes. needed to. And then yes. he likely wouldn't need to. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you're forced to persuade your child, your child... So your child also feels forced. Chances are I will pick the child up and that something has happened. It means I'm not acknowledging his mental health or validating. He's then stuck on a roundabout of being in trouble and not liking school more, frustrated and draining. They've offered to come and get him and offered to unsettle his comfort zone. So pressure to get him out. Mm. Yeah. I've had people tell me that educational welfare officers have come to the house and like bundle children into the car in their pajamas and just, mm. yeah. Um, yeah, they need to realise that staying at home isn't an option. People have had that said to them. Um, a teacher came to my house to discuss a plan to help us, so she said, but she told my daughter who was hiding behind the sofa traumatised, I was broken and not sure what to do for the best as I believed I'd go to court. She said, you're just being naughty, not coming. Your mum will go to jail and that will be your fault. Surely you don't want that. You must come to school. I finally stood up and said, that's not going to happen. Um, I yeah. can't read on to that, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you had power to say get out of my house because many people yeah. wouldn't have, wouldn't feel no. You know, no. To do that. The educational welfare officer told my son he had to go to school no matter how ill he felt, otherwise he'd be responsible for sending his parents to prison. He was finally diagnosed with ME and chronic fatigue syndrome and is now bed bound. These people have too much power over us and our children have no yeah. health training whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, my child spent 18 months on a room on his own not learning and that was in school I'm guessing Amy um Paula says I was a truant when the legal power first came into place my parents were threatened I continued to be unable to access school I had the system telling me and my mum me my mum could go to prison my mum crying about being sent to prison me holding her as she cried did I go in no did I feel as though I was generally going to destroy my whole family because I was so effing useless I couldn't go to school I did yeah I'm 36 and I still have school trauma mm. <sighs> I'm just going to read these. I know these are hard to hear, but it is really important that we have these voices heard. I might just send this video recording in as evidence. My son is still out of education over a year on. He has been so traumatised by the school system. We all have as a family. He currently has no school placement, but waiting for the LA to provide tuition. And that's also a thing that stops. Like That's a barrier, right? We can't access medical needs tuition mm -hmm. as quickly as we need to. Mm -hmm. um, he currently has no school placement, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, a lovely independent school has shown interest in his consult, the LA sent to them. It, I would like to, I would like to get my hopes up that he will get tailored to him education, but I won't be holding my breath just yet. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, there isn't enough people who understand the complex needs of our children have either. They honestly believe they have choice in their behaviour and any help given is basically trying to make them conform or mask or fit in. It's just not helpful. 
yeah I think we're all on the same page yeah definitely and, I'm just gonna it's the about. training isn't it well the with training. medical needs that's not always yeah. yeah, the medical that's the needs as well. I was just that's more or less what I was just going to say. You know, sometimes we get that, and then you know, their role is sort of for children that are medically ill that are going to continue with the curriculum at home until they can then reintegrate back into school. So then, you know, this was what we had when we had medical tuition come out. I mean, she was a lovely lady, but she came with her mind of what she wanted to teach and how she was going to teach him in that. And I was like, he isn't going to engage with you because that's you know, this is actually the problem. So yeah it's just frustrating because like you said you know this absolutely is something that I talk about a lot at my council meetings and when I'm there you know there has to be a shift in attitude and a want to realize that a change needs to happen and in order to do that you need people with lived experience within these roles and a you know the the child's point of view and their understanding of this properly because otherwise parents and professionals are just always going to be at loggerheads yeah 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 and I, I, think... I was on them um... oh on. sorry go on no go ahead oh, I was... oh thank you oh, no, i know i was just going to say i was on a really good training that ellie delivered yesterday um and they were kind of senkos and teachers um and she was talking about alternatives like alternative strategies and it was it was so well received like um one of the techniques was called or approaches was called name to tame where you're basically like naming emotions um there was another connect and redirect i'm going to do some further reading on those myself but and yeah there was just such a they, they were just so well received and i just think actually yeah there's just a real need for that knowledge that actually it's just reframing it and relearn you know almost like a new lens of like this isn't behavior in the sense of like naughtiness this is actually a you know communication and actually here are some new tools I think there would be an appetite for that and you know most you know kind of there are some you know you do come across kind of bad eggs uh, in this in this system actually a lot of people meet up just don't have the right information and so you find yourself simultaneously needing their help but also having to give them the information that you need them to have so anyway yeah. that's that would be my hope for the future um, which rule, is not great people... when you're exhausted you know <laughs> no as a rule sorry i was just we'll talk um all right go on No, I was just going to say, like, <laughs> it's one of them that, you know, at a time when we're really exhausted, we then end up educating people. And I had that quite a lot of times through our journey where, like, I would spend, you know, the hour that they were in my house educating them on PDA and anxiety and, you know, the school-based trauma and all of that. And it was, like, actually at the end of it, I'd just, like, they'd go away and I'd think, wow, I'm even more exhausted because I'm trying to teach them. They were meant to be coming here to support me. Obviously, I put that in because in the hope that that person then goes on to another child and they have a bit more but like you say this is this is where it's got to come from the top because you can meet individuals like that that are willing I find sometimes to change their attitude or learn but it depends on what's coming up above from them and I think that's the same mm. potentially with the um education welfare officers you know they might be a bit sympathetic to your story but if a coming above them is telling them no this is a family you need to find it doesn't matter what their view or opinion is. And this is where, like you say, we need to get it right up there to government, which is why the petition obviously is a big one to go in and be looked at at what everybody's, the amount of people that we've got supporting in their stories. But it's equally with this chance to give your evidence like that to try and get the change made from the top. Yeah, 100%. I think what's what's coming out loud and clear from all of our families is that, you know, we want what we want the best for our kids we want when it's appropriate none of us would choose for our child not to be in school it's really mm. hard work you know <laughs> like you know you only have to look at flipping you know when it's school holidays and like parents of children who don't have additional needs that two weeks into the school holidays oh my god someone take these kids away from me i can't wait for school to start again you know, like, and you're like hello <laughs> 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 you know, like don't get me wrong I adore my child and I never expected that during his education he would be at home for three years that's not something I planned in it's mm. not something he planned in it's not something we wanted had we been able to access support and help sooner it wouldn't have been necessary um, and this and is the thing with 
with the um, early intervention, our local authority talk about a lot at the moment, early intervention, but it tends to be at that point of early intervention when people don't want to listen to the parents that are having concerns because they're not being seen in school. But I think if I had one wish out of this, like, you know, the three of us can sit here now and be probably a lot more relaxed and smile and look back on our experiences and giggle at the frustration. But that feeling inside me, I know, will never, ever leave me of how frustrated and traumatised I was. Yeah. But you think for them change, my wish would be that we don't have to traumatise our children to the point that mm. we do. Or and ourselves. I think, yeah, mm. oh, yeah, and ourselves. And I think that is, you know, such a crucial thing that is being talked about a lot more now and, and definitely with like Dr. Naomi Fisher, you know, we we need to be able to learn to get to a point and say, actually, what you're offering us or what you're telling us is support is not working. And I have to start. I wish I hadn't have pushed my child to the point I did before we stopped. And I think that's, you know, that's a really crucial thing to get across again to to the government, to the local authorities, to schools. You know, we, we have a right as a parent to decide when enough is enough of, of traumatising our children. And it, it like you said, Heidi, if they liked school and they enjoyed it, there would be no trauma anyway. It would be a case of they wanted to go. Yeah. Um, children children the point are, of that was, but... like all humans, but children especially, are so keen to learn, you know. And when you see you know a child whether they've got additional needs or not engaged in something that interests them and supported well you know it's the most glorious thing to look at and actually I don't know if you've um, I'm just gonna mention this I don't know if you've seen um, a copy of the square pegs book yet it's out at the beginning of February um, but I got an author copy and there's a bit in here that I thought was just so interesting um, about the whole thing about rewards and sanctions and the research that basically says, you know, because people are like, oh, well, we don't use sanctions, we use rewards. But actually, there's research that says if you attach rewards or sanctions to a learning experience, but let's talk about rewards specifically. If you attach rewards to a learning experience, you strip that experience of its inherent motivation and you strip it of its inherent joy and ability to become a activity that a child wants to engage in just for the sake of it. You know, yeah. just because they want to learn, you shouldn't have to give them stickers for them to want to learn something. If they want to learn something, they will engage in it. So it's about making those resources accessible and making it, you know, letting them take the lead on what interests them, what fascinates them, what they're going to get excited about. And if you think back at your school career, I had lessons that I would run into and they were my favorite lesson all week. And I could have spent all week with that teacher. They're the lessons I did well in because I was mm -hmm. interested, fascinated, engaged in the subject matter. You know, and then there were lessons that I would skive off. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, it actually, I find it fascinating that because that is actually exactly the same in adults. So um, the motivation and payment, because you'd think that everyone's motivated by money. But actually, like, I think it's Daniel Pink in his book, Drive. It's exactly the same with adults. And they did these kind of experiments where they were like people were building like Lego just for like fun and then kind of or a similar sort of experiment and then doing exactly the same but paid and then yeah the actual output went down um and there is it's exactly the same relationship so our kids are no different that motivation well motivation always comes from within doesn't it always it is sparked yeah it's sparked by something and then you kind of go for it and yeah everyone kind of like it's yeah, that carrot that's stick thing. Like we do not need a carrot any more than we need the stick. <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah exactly. Of, like, put the carrot and the stick down, <laughs> and let yeah. the donkey decide if it would like to move. You know, <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. if it isn't, work out why it feels it can't. You know, but yeah, I think it's so important that we that we get these voices. So what we're going to do is I put a link for the. Um, for the uh, call to evidence. I am going to do a mailer today. I will link back to this video and I will do a quick template for people and I'll put it on the website at HeidiMaver.com and I'll share it with you guys so that we can, people can use a template. I think the deadline for submissions is, is it the 9th of February? That yeah. Makes me, yeah. So we've got a little bit of time. If you want to, when you make a submission for evidence, I'll put it in the mailer. If you want to copy us in, we'll collate some stuff as well. Like, it, I don't know if you want to copy you guys in or us, me and I'm happy to have Jodie, who does my admin, to collate stuff. We can maybe pull everything together and put it in a big PDF as well. Um, 
what's the email address for you if people want to reach out to you i've got it in my chat hold on here it is maddie and susan dot no school finds at gmail.com and no sarah uh, insight say again no sarah I said, no sarah's insight <laughs> God, I'm just going to call you, Sarah, and I'm yeah, going to do it. Do it. Makes you to stop correcting. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, I'll just I'll just accept it. I'll be like, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to use coercion and control. I'm going to change your name. <laughs> It'd be like Dave from uh, Only Fools and Horses. So you changed your name on your passport. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Just find me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. That, that works. works. We know that. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. work. Um, yeah. Just remind me petition delivery we've got a date that people can put in their diaries right do you want to just talk a little bit about that before we finish do you want to go maddie would you want me to you go me okay right right so march the 21st tuesday march the 21st at 3 30 maddie and i uh with ellie are going to hand in the petition to downing street it's quite it's, it's like a ceremonial thing i don't meet anyone from like the ha like the prime minister doesn't come out or anything like a well, okay. the door do I wear a cape? Do we wear Can capes? We wear a cape. Yeah, I think you need to wear capes. We're not allowed to wear fancy dress. Like, what? I just think there's, there's all these rules. You're mm. not allowed to wear fancy dress and things. But we do have, I think we get given, I think change give us a giant box. And we hand in a box, ceremonial box. The door opens, we hand it in. But <clears throat> what we thought we'd do um, is meet um, somewhere central probably like half a mile away so probably like parliament square and if families would like to walk with us and accompany us to touch the gate um which our families will know that expression very well and walk up to the gate with us um they would be very very welcome it's it it won't be a process of like streets won't close or anything so it'd be a pavement peaceful walk but be very welcome for people peaceful. to come <laughs> I'm going to get your blaster and I'm going to play. You can't touch this. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that's brilliant. I've practiced, practiced my dance piece. I think I think Honor said that we could have a, a pitch. She might lend us a PA system. So, yeah, we sort of meet, do the short walk, probably stop, swing by the Department for Education because that's on route, I think. Um, just stop touch out there, gate. touch their gate. Just swing um, by. <laughs> Swing we'll make, by. We'll make a gate rubbing map. <laughs> yes, a bit, a bit some brass rubbings. <laughs> yeah, gate touching along the way. Um, and then, yeah, meet at the gates. Go get to the gates of 10 Down Street. We'll wander up, hand it in. It doesn't take very long. Have a picture, strike a pose, um, and then be talking about it on like social media and stuff. Um, I wear a formal I could do. I could yeah. wear my gown. I could wear my gown from university. That would be funny. I won't wear my gown. Are you allowed to wear like slogan t shirts or anything like that? Or is it very like I don't know. I have to we've got some time. I think it's only Yeah, I think it's only us that sort of like go through the gate. Yeah, you go, go through, through like we all stand at the gate. like they that. Won't let anything in there, but... <laughs> like that scene in Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> all the poor people going down with the <laughs> And you stride out to number 10 down. Go out. Yeah, we'll be, yeah, heavily, heavily escorted. I think there's a cabinet meeting that day as well. I think there's like, there should be loads of ministers around. We might try and meet some MPs. Don't know if anyone wants to meet an MP that day, then <laughs> you could come and meet your MP. You've really sold that then, Susan. Would oh, yeah. Come and meet an MP. <laughs> you just have to should I just articulate that a bit better? What you can do is if, like, you write to your own MP, if they're in Parliament that day, which Tuesday is a very popular day to be in Parliament, then you could arrange to meet them as well and talk to them about attendance, and that'd be good. And they might even take you for tea. You could ask them. I've never been for tea at Parliament, but, you know, if anyone wants to take me, I'll go. Lisa Marie says, I handed a petition at Downing Street myself on a separate matter, and we were allowed scarves and badges. Right. Operation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, one's saying that can't be this big. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so okay. we'll we'll get more details out about that. We'll get oh, the date. Let me just start. Can I answer that question about children? Because yeah. I'd like to say something on this. We are not encouraging people to bring children to this walk because it is in a weekday um, term. Uh, what's it term time um and i would hate hate for anyone to bring your child out of school or and put yourself in a worse position for fines and prosecution 
what you do is up to you and there's you know if your child is if you, if it's safe for you to be there with your child then that is up to you we're not specifically encouraging the bringing of children if that makes does that make sense we have like an ethical responsibility to make sure that everyone on the you know the adults are there are there but i would hate for people to then suffer a final prosecution so i'm not yeah. we're not particularly encouraging that at all actually if you've um, got a would... child or you've got a child with the otas that might be different but again it's an adult's event really um you know it, and we know that people have childcare issues and that might play into that and but yeah don't for god's sake don't take your kids out of school to do this um and uh if you have a child who has a barrier to attendance yeah. and you think that they might have repercussions for you that's why we're saying don't bring your kids because the last thing you want is a picture we are of you also talking Go on. yeah we are also talking about like four people obviously that can't come or whatever about doing a bit of a live stream when we're there as well just um probably through our page um just so people on the day can you know see who's around yeah. see what's doing it just just because it is a long way to expect people to travel yeah. and and do things. Yeah. So sure. I think as well, if like people want to do stuff locally, um, then that could also work well. Like if you want to turn up to your local authority with your local, if you've got a local send crisis action group, and then you wanted to kind of time that, um, then yeah, reach out to us, yep. talk about that. If very much, this is very much like grassroots organised. This is kind of like me and Maddie sort of sorting something out that's kind of peaceful safe um but also kind of yeah states what we need to say to the government which is that this yeah. isn't working it's about a show of solidarity and numbers rather than us like throwing eggs at people and shit like that yeah we'll yeah that's that the next one time. <laughs> <laughs> Right then, my loves, thank you for joining me this morning. Um, for those who need it, the link for the call for evidence, I will put it back up on screen. It is in the comments. It will show at the top of the comments. Um, so, yeah, if you want to copy us in, then copy us in. If not, then that's cool. Um, you've got until the 9th of February. If you're on my mailing list, I'll get a template out to you. If you're not, I'll get it to Susan. Susan. Susan, can we do that as an update on the petition as well? Susan, yeah. can we do that as an update on the petition? We could, if you get that together, Heidi, we could put that up as a petition update, okay. and then that's there for that'd be amazing. Guys to follow we have a program. guidance document for if you want to. Yeah, see this is the format we would recommend that you use. That would be, um, that'd be yeah. so cool. Just to make it as easy for people as possible to engage if they can. Right, lovely. I'm going to take some paracetamol. I've got a really bad headache. Um, but thanks for joining me this morning, loves. Um, and That's talking uh, to us two that don't stop talking. <laughs> no, I, I think it's the three bottles of wine we consumed last night. I don't uh, think that could yeah, help. That, that could do it. <laughs> Anyway, I was celebrating something that I can't tell well, you yeah, about. What, what were you celebrating? We celebrated being a best-selling author. My wow. copy's arriving today. I can't it wait. It is linked to that, but it's something I got a very exciting email about a very exciting meeting next week. I can't tell you any more than that. I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Um, okay. <laughs> you have to find us first. As soon as I can, you know I'm going to be shouting about it because I am. Oh, I can't wait. You know, rent a dog. Sorry, because Heidi will kill Sarah, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Susan's safe. I'm, I'm safe. I'm all good. Sorry, random Sarah. Well, assuming that I haven't managed to get you to change your name by then, of course. Oh, yeah, that's true. Damn it. Yeah. Uh, it's all good right. to catch up. Nice to see you both. Stay on and I'll just end Maybe. the broadcast and then we'll say goodbye off in the green room. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Ooh. See you later.